Good everyone, I welcome you to the 13th episode of our physics secondary school for um, course and today we are going to be dealing with the refraction of light so please watch this video to the end to gain as much as possible. We've been talking about light since the past um, two episodes and now in this episode we are talking about one special property of light so we, which we explained in the 11th episode of this course when we dealt with wave. Now, the refractive property of light is defined as the bending of light rays as they move across the boundary between two media of different densities, thus causing a change in its direction. So you can see that this is the bending that causes a change in its direction. And not just direction, it also causes a change in the wavelength and the velocity of light. That is why when you pass light through a prism, the different lights that have different wavelength, wavelengths and velocities, they end up having having to be separated because they do not pass through the um, the prism at the same speed. So because it's because of the phenomenon of refraction. This was one of the experiments performed by Isaac Newton in centuries ago. This is one example to show us that refraction is actually a day-to-day -day circadian phenomenon because it occurs even more often than we can think of it. Look at this um, rod that is immersed in a bowl of water. You can see that when you look at the rod from the from as you're looking at it, it appears bent. So this is called the uh, apparent bending of objects when viewed in water. So and it is caused by refraction because those rays of light, when they are passing from the water out of the water, they bend and they bend away from the normal. We talked about this in the previous um, two episodes where we talked about reflection, refraction, interference, diffraction, and polarization being the five principal properties of waves. And just so you remember, light is also a wave, so it exhibits these properties. Now, this refraction is basically the bending of light. This is a diagram illustrating the process of refraction. And in this case, you can see that an incident ray OP is approaching the um, rectangular glass block. Now, when it enters the rectangular glass block, the angle between that incident ray and the normal is, is called I. It's called the angle of incidence. Now, when it enters, it, that same ray passes through the block, and you can see that it is deviated through a small angle. And then at the end of the day, that angle of refraction, R, is smaller than the angle of incidence because it has been bent towards the normal ON. Now, when it, when that, that um, refracted ray passes to the other end of the glass prism, you can see that it still bends again as it emerges through the glass. And then you have the emergent ray. Now, this emergent ray is quite um, is quite larger than the refracted ray. Now, this is basically how refraction works. There are two laws which describe the process of refraction. The first one is that the incident ray, the refracted ray, and the normal at the point of incidence all lie on the same plane. So that means they are still on the same flat plane, and that plane is called the plane of incidence. Now, second law is that the ratio of the sign of the angle of incidence to the sign of the angle of refraction is a constant for a given pair of media. So this second law is also known as Snell's law and is given as sine i over sine r is equals to um, a constant and that constant is the refractive index of the particular uh, medium. So it's for a given pair of media though. The second law of reflection also known as Snell's law can be, rep can be um, represented mathematically as um, sine i over sine r equals to this the, the constant and that constant is um, for a given pair of media so the constant is known as the refractive index it's it's it, it's symbolized by the capital letter n in, in bold now it's it's known as the refractive index of a second medium with respect to the first medium and it's a number that gives the measure of refraction or bending of light as it travels from one medium because the refractive index is a ratio of the first, the second with respect to the first. For example, if you have light that is moving from air to glass, then the refractive index from air to glass will be equal to the inverse of the refractive index from glass to air. Now you'll be able to guess why. This is because of the reversibility of light. So the reason is that when you reverse the direction of light, you are also reversing the order of every constant or every um, every every quantity that is being tied to that part of light and then we know that Snell's law also is dependent on the direction of light because it depends from the second to the first so when you reverse the direction of light you are now taking Snell's law from the first to the second so this is the the um 
the demonstration of that reversibility and refraction is due to the change in the speed of light from one medium to another so you can also represent Snell's law as the ratio of the speed of light in air to the ratio of speed of light in glass that is the ratio you can that's another way you can define Snell's law from when you're moving from air to glass one way of investigating the law of reflection or rather the um, Snell's law of reflection is by using a rectangular glass block placed on a sheet of paper and drawing the outline by pencil. So you draw lines such as P, um, O, and, and you draw them marking angles of 30 degree, 40 degree, 50 degree, 60 degree, and 70 degree with the normal. So a single ray of light from a ray box is directed along P, O, as you can see in the diagram, and the emergence ray is marked with a pencil. So there's a way that is done in the laboratory. And this is a very good verification. Now, at the end of the one, we um, draw a table of all the values of the angles of incidence and their corresponding angles of refraction. You will see that the ratio will correspond with the refractive index of the, of the particular glass that is given, which is, which means you are you are going to make it of the slope, the slope of the graph of of when you draw a graph of of the sign of the incidence to the sign of against the sign of the refraction. So you will get. The slope which is equal to the refractive index of whatever medium you are using for the measurement there's another method which can be used to find the refractive index and this time of glass by the real and apparent depth method now in physics there is a law which says that the refractive index is equal to the ratio of the real depth to the apparent depth so what that means is that refractive index equals the real depth all over the, the um, apparent depth so in this case i want to look for the refractive index by that method so all you need to do is you need a glass block placed vertically over an object and you have a, you need to have a pin on a straight line drawn on a paper then that pin or straight line is you have the you put the glass block on that pin and then with the aid of a such pin fixed to a cork piece of cork head on a clamp that can slide up and down the apparent depth of the object can be found by using the method of non-parallax. Now, non-parallax means the apparent movement of objects when they are not the same distance from an observer. Now, in this case, it, it deals with the fact that when the two objects are in the same at the same level where they where they appear to be seen, when it when it gets to that point where it appears to be at the same level with the objects, that is the apparent depth. And then you are going to record that as the apparent depth. And then when you look when you look for the ratio of the real to the apparent depth, you get the refractive index of that solid. There are three effects of of refraction, and these are the explanations of them. There are more effects, but these are the three major effects of refraction. The first effect is the apparent depth of a swimming pool. Now, assuming this is a swimming pool and you have the um an object in the water. For example, this is the bottom. As you, know, you have an object at the bottom, at the same level as the bottom of the water. Now, in this method, in, in this um, process, the object appears to be closer to the surface than it actually is. So, and so does the depth appear to be. So, the depth of the, that is the bottom of the swimming pool appears to be closer to the surface. And this is because of this process, whereby as the light waves are trying to come out of the water, they are refracted away from the normal because air is less dense than water. So anytime you are, you are transferring light waves, you see light waves transferring from, from a denser to a less dense medium, they always refract away from the normal. So as a result of this, when you trace those um, those refracted rays back backwards, you will give it will give you an apparent depth which is closer to the surface. That is why this happens in both of these um, diagrams. Another observable effect of refraction is the apparent bending of a stick partly immersed in water now if you put a, a stick slanted in water and you bend and you and you look at it from above the water it look as if that part that is in water has been bent now it is still because of refraction because that bottom of the stick that is below the water when the light rays from that bottom are getting to your eyes they also refract away from the normal and as a result of that when you trace the um the refracted ray behind they will meet at a point which is above the, the original point below the water and because of that you can see the straight the the traces of the line which shows the um parts by through which you can see the um the apparent stick so this is the bending apparent bending of objects in water due to refraction the third observable effect of refraction is the bringing of an object into view now this is the process whereby an object which cannot be seen ordinary by the eye 
in a second medium when viewed through a first medium when you um when you when you when you make a second medium and insert that object in the second medium the object suddenly becomes viewable because of the fact that the right rays from that invisible object will now be refracted towards the observer because they are reflected away from the normal so they become visible to the eye of the observer so you can see in this coin in this case in the first diagram you can see that the the the, the eyesight does not um see um the coin which is at the bottom of this this um this container but when you fill the container to a certain level of water which can bring it into view then that water will refract the light rays from the coin and then bend them towards the eyes so they become visible another useful and um, interesting effect of reflect of refraction is when light travels from an optically more dense to an optically less dense medium so to study this we we'll place a semicircular glass block on a sheet of white paper and you draw the outline with a pencil now the mid the um, midpoint of its plane of a plane side is marked on paper so the midpoint of the plane side which was on the base is marked on the plane on the paper then using a ray box you can direct an incident ray which is oa towards a now this ray will be refracted along a b yes it will be refracted along that that will be the refracted ray away from normal since glass is more dense than air so part of the incident ray is also reflected back into the glass by the bottom surface pq of the glass block so now this 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 reflected ray ad is weak and is not as bright as the refracted ray but as the angle of incidence is increased gradually and gradually you will notice that at a particular point in time the angle of refraction also increases and the refracted ray is further bent away from normal so as it continues being bent and at its at its value of the angle of incidence a stronger is a strong refracted ray and a weak reflected ray are obtained so you are getting a strong refracted and weak reflected but as you continue to increase the angle you get to a point whereby the refracted ray does not emerge from the glass but instead it lies along the path pq so you can see pq in this diagram on the glass air interface now this particular angle of incidence at which the angle of refraction is 90 degree is known as the critical angle so the angle of incidence where this occurs is called the critical angle and this process is known as the total internal reflection so this of course, in, in that once the angle is in the in the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, the um critical angle, then the the um re, the refracted ray will begin will begin to be reflected back into the um initial medium. The critical angle can be seen as the angle of incidence in the denser medium when the angle of refraction in the less dense medium is 90 degrees. Now, from this explanation we've given, when the angle of incidence slightly exceeds the critical angle, the refractive ray disappears and a strongly reflected ray is obtained. The incidence ray is then set total, totally ref reflected back into the denser medium along PQ. So such a reflection is done as a total internal reflection and is defined as a reflection of an incidence ray of light at the interface between the medium of incidence and another medium of lower refractive index when the angle of incidence in the denser medium exceeds the critical angle. For total internal reflection to occur, there are two conditions that must be satisfied. First of all, the um, light must be traveling from an optically more dense to an optically less dense medium. And so, it must be going from a denser to a less dense. The second um, condition is that the angle of incidence in the denser medium must be greater than the critical angle. Now, one application and demonstration of total internal reflection is in the field of view of a fish underwater. Now, a fish underwater or a swimmer moving on his back underwater can have a full view of everything above the water surface even if the sun is in the horizon even the sun is in the that is the horizon you can also see the sun as long as the water surface is not ruffled now how, the reason for this is that there is total internal reflection because the rays of light at the um such as pl and qr at the edges of his cone now the, the is there's a cone of um view so that that um that field of view is, is like a cone now this 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 ray, ray of light from the edges of this cone reach the eye of the fish or the diver after refraction along um the the L E and E and R E. So this L E and R E, these are the points where this L E and R E they are points where the line the um the line of the light rays refract into the water. So this rays just graze the air water boundary and their angle of incidence is 90 degree. So you can see their angle of incidence is 90 degrees the most extreme rays 
So they raise the eye of the fish. That means the rays that are flat and horizontal. They raise the, at the eyes of the fish. They just raise the air water boundary. Their angle of incidence is 90. Now the angle of refraction is given by sine 90 over sine r. That's 4 over 3. So sine r is equal to 3 over 4. Is 0 0.75. So that means the r, that is the r is approximately 49 degree. That is the angle of refraction. So this is angle of refraction where the angle of incidence is 90 degree. Now all the light from outside the, wa the water entering the eye of a fish in the water is concentrated into a cone of a half angle of 49 degree. So you can imagine that the angle, the, you can see that the, the, um, the fish is, is seen a, a 180 field of view with just a 49 degree half cone angle. There is another phenomenon known as minimum deviation and this occurs when light is refracted through a triangular prism. So you can see that the incidence is the incidence is, is going, going to meet the um the prism and then it is it gets ref refracted then you have the refracted ray which is qr then finally when the ray is emerging from the prism to the other side you have an emergent ray which is rs now you can see that in this case normally the incidence ray was supposed to be parallel to the if emergent ray but in this case the incidence ray is not par parallel it's inside it is deviated from it so this deviation we often measure this deviation it is an angular deviation it's called the angle of deviation now this angle of deviation it can be used also to look for the refractive index of an angle of, of a triangle because this prism deviates the incidence ray through an angle known as the angle of deviation and this is the angle between the incidence ray and the emergence ray of light when you trace them backwards the amount of deviation is de de determined by the angle of incidence the, the refractive angle of the prism and also the refractive index of the material of the prism now experiments show that the angle of deviation varies with the angle of incidence as shown so basically this this um, is a graph that uh, measures the deviation against the incidence so the deviation actually is dependent on the angle of incidence so you can see that as the angle of incidence increases the deviation decreases that decreases then as it as the angle of incidence increases it also gets the, the um deviation gets to a minimum point so there's a mean that minimum point is the point at which the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of emergence now many of you might be thinking that how would this be possible why would there be something like this the reason is that the light rays that pass through the prism are reversible along their directions so that means if you if you if you change your um side of view if you change from the incident side to the emergence side if you change switch to the opposite side of the triangle you will notice that the, when you take the emergence as the incident and you trace it backward, you will still get the same path of light. So that is because of the rectilinear propagation of light. As a result of this, at this minimum deviation, there is a point and a single point at which the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of emergence. This is the equation that represents the relationship between the um, minimum deviation and the refractive index. Now you have your refractive index is equal to the sine of half of the sum of your refractive angle and your uh, and your angle of deviation. Now this angle of deviation is, 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 is the angle of minimum deviation. Then you now divide by the sine of half of the angle of, of, of or rather the refractive angle. Now the refractive angle is, is a property of the um, triangle of a, of, a, of a particular um, of, of, of any particular prism, then the minimum deviation is, is also is also unique to the, that same prism. Now let's delve into the mixing of different light um, light colors. Now light as a wave is consists of different components, and those components they appear with different colors to our eyes. So it is a biological pr property. Who knows how it works, how it functions? But all we know is that the different lights uh, with different frequencies have their different colors. So for example, light at a light at a high frequency is often associated with blue, while light at a lower frequency is often associated with um, red. Or light at a higher higher wavelength, such as 700 nanometers, is associated with something like um, or like red, and with a smaller wavelength, is, we have the blue end of the spectrum. Now, basically, what all this means is that these different colors they actually exist as different forms of light. And one of the surprising things is that they can be mixed together. So we've been talking about light energy and light energy and light energy. Now this light energy can also be mixed together, the different components of light. So when we mix them together in a particular way, known as the additive color mixing, when you mix blue and red, you will get magenta. Blue and green will give cyan. Red and green will give yellow. And then when you combine all these three colors together, you will get white. 
so basically white is like a mixture of all the components of light in equal proportions if you are very good at using computers you will notice that actually when you talk about the um, computer um, version of, of colors you see that when you mix together three different um, components of green blue and and red in on your computer and you want to form a color with that to look white when they are equal and when they are all zero it will form black so when there is no none of those colors existent or present in that unit of of, of space for example when, when we are dealing with computers we we call it the pixel so if that pixel is has none of those um color um properties of light it's it becomes black but if it has the maximum of each of them it becomes white so this is one demonstration of the fact that light consists of these um, quantities of its components now when we talk about subtractive color mixing what you are doing is you are mixing the components of light in a subtractive way and it is the one we make use of when we when we when we realistically color things because our eyes they understand colors in a subtractive mixing so, but additive mixing on that is, is used by computers and um, basically when you are studying them in science. Now, this subtractive mixing, we know that red plus blue plus yellow will give will give um black. Now, we have um, purple is gotten from the mixing of red and blue. You can try it if you have colors because that's subtractive color mixing, which our eyes are very used to. And the reason for that is that when we um, see blue, it's actually a transmitted light, but the one that is actually absorbed is not the color so because when we look at the a green object the the, the 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 part of light that is being transmitted is green but the one that is actually absorbed is not is the component of 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 light that does not contain green so i hope you understand this part it's it's quite um a little bit tricky it was this was part of the work that was um brought about by Isaac newton he did a lot of work in prisms and light rays is um, responsible for some of these our our conclusions and the most knowledge we know about colors today now this is one important part of refraction i decided we are going to go over in this video so let's move on to the next part where we're talking about different types of lenses when we talk about lenses lenses they are unlike mirrors light can pass through them and refraction can occur but when we talk about mirrors only reflection can occur with mirrors when we talk about lenses, there are different types of lenses. There are majorly two kinds, which are the converging or convex lens and the diverging or concave lens. But these two kinds can be mixed together in different ways and different methods. So you, that's why you have six different kinds here. So we have yeah, the first one we have here is a biconvex lens. So it consists of two sides which are both convex in shape. Then we have um, the plano convex, which has a straight and a convex side. We have the concave or convex, which have a, which has a concave and a concave side and the convex side we have the biconcave which has two concave sides we have the plano concave which has a plane side and a concave side then we have the convex or concave which has a convex side bordering a um, concave side now most of the time we uh, will be dealing with um, biconvex and biconcave lenses in this um, section of this video because they are the most simple for us to understand because they have similar sides they have similar type of lenses at each side then you the application of these lenses they are often used by by um, medical practitioners such as um, ophthalmologists and opticians to correct eye defects for example the concave convex and the convex or concave they are used as contact lenses to correct defective eyeballs visions like so like short-sightedness and um, long-sightedness just like mirrors lenses also have their image formation methods for example you have the part of a, of a lens the um, optical center of the lens is the point through which the rays of light pass without being deviated then that optical center is often the point through the um the point the, the, the line passing through the optical center of the lens and during the center of curvature of its surfaces is called the principal axis then the principal focus is the is a, of a converging lens or convex lens is the point to which all rays parallel and close to the principal axis converge after refraction whereas the principal focus of a diverging or concave lens is the point from which all rays appear to diverge so basically a convex lens is converging and it, and it often forms real images whereas a concave lens is diverging and often forms and always forms virtual images now we can see um this is the basic setup for the formation of images by lenses. The first process is that a ray which passes, which is parallel to the principal axis, and which and which is close to the principal axis, which refracts to the lens and passes through the principal focus. 
So when a ray is parallel to the axis, it um, refracts through the lens and passes through the principal focus on the other side. Now you notice that in the case of lenses, unlike mirrors, they have two fo foci. The first foci is on one side, then the second is on the second side. Now basically, another type of ray is, is um, studied when we want to talk about lens. We have a ray from the object which passes through the optical center of the lens and it also emerges undeviated. Now when you have a ray passing through the optical center, which is often the middle of the um, lens, it will pass through without deviating. So you can see it in this diagram, this ray that passes through AB goes undeviated now basically sometimes we also have a third ray which is a ray which is which passes through the principal focus and to emerge parallel to the principal axis after reflection so now we have a ray an when it passes through the principal focus of the lens it will emerge parallel to the principal axis on the other side without being um after refraction now just like for your mirrors we also have the different ray diagrams for lenses so we're starting with the con con concave, um, or rather the convex lens, which is the con converging lens. Now we have different ways. For, for example, these are some of them. When you have your object um, beyond your 2F, so we have the markings on the principal axis. You have your F markings and your 2F markings, which is twice the distance of the focus from the optical center, which is C. So on the left and the right hand sides, we have the markings for the focus and two times of the focus. Now, when you have your object beyond the twice of your focus, then when you combine your ray diagrams using your parallel ray, which which passes through the focus, then you then your straight on deviating ray, which passes through the center of the of the um, lens, which is a convex lens, you will get your image distance. It will be beyond. It will be between f and two f on the other side. Then in the second instance, when you have your object between f and two f, your image will be beyond two um, f. Also, when you have your object between F and C, which is the um, optical center, you have your image beyond, um, behind the object and to be virtual. So this is the only kind of virtual image of um, um, that is gotten from a convex lens. All other types of images are, are real images, except when the object is between the focus and the pole. That's the only condition where we can get a virtual image. But on the other hand, for a... For a concave or diverging lens, the images are always are always um, virtual. So no matter the distance, for example, let's take a, an arbitrary distance just before the focus. You see that when we trace the lines, trace the parallel li lines to meet at the focus, and then we trace the other line, undeviating line, they will meet between the object and the concave lens. And, the, and this image is always virtual for a concave lens. So this is the these are some of the image um, construction for um, concave and convex lenses. You can also try to form some of them on your own by using making use of the different um, um, positions of the objects for the image. You should note that for your lenses, just like your mirrors, you also make use of the lens equation. So you, that is equals to um, one the, the reciprocal of the sum of the reciprocals of the um, object and image distance will be equal to the reciprocal of the focal length of that um, lens so that is it but in general the um, focus of a convex lens is positive whereas the focus of a concave lens is negative now this is as far as we can go in this video because of um, the fact that the video is getting long but you can try the question on the screen which i will address and i will uh, and i will solve later in another episode in this series thank you for watching and see you next episode